For more information about this or any episode of the podcast, check out the website at philosophizethis.org. We have additional content, further reading, transcripts of every show, all free, of course. But if you value the show as an educational resource and you want to help keep it going, you can find out more about how to do that at patreon.com slash philosophize this. Or alternatively, if you're buying something from Amazon this week anyway, consider clicking through our banner. It's at the bottom center of the landing page of philosophizethis.org. Small percentage goes back to the show. It may just be a click for you, but every little bit adds up. Thank you for wanting to know more today than you did yesterday, and I hope you love the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen West. This is Philosophize This, and boy, oh boy, am I excited today, because I'm in the presence of a man that I've looked up to for quite some time now, since I was but a child, a man who carries a list of accomplishments so vast, so extensive, that to even try to mention them right now would be a lost cause because I'd run out of the valuable time that he's bestowed upon me. Professor of Philosophy at City University of New York, a New York Times contributor, the CEO and founder of the How to Be a Stoic blog, celebrity philosopher, uh, astronaut, Nobel laureate, Massimo Pigliucci. How are you today, my <laughs> I'm very good. I am definitely not a former astronaut, but and probably not many of the things you mentioned also, but still, it's a pleasure to be look, here. Look, man, you got to pad the resume a little bit. We're living in the era of Monster.com. Everybody's doing it. Anyway, out of respect to your time, I want to delve right into the questions. So the last few episodes of the show, we've been talking about David Hume, all right? And I think so much of understanding what these thinkers were trying to get at back in their time is removing our own modern cultural biases from the equation. So much of making someone like a David Hume relatable to people in modern times is understanding the historical, cultural, and political context that he's operating from. I'd like to put ourselves into the shoes of David Hume. I'd like to put you into the 17th century leather buckled shoes that David Hume no doubt would have been in. Put yourself in David Hume's buckled shoes for a second, and can you speak briefly on A, what is this political, cultural, historical climate that he's existing in? And B, as David Hume is writing his anthology of work over the course of his lifetime, what questions are facing his generation, and what questions did David Hume think that he was answering? Well, those are excellent questions. Uh, I mean, first of all, I, I do think you're right. It's it's important to understand the cultural and historical context because otherwise one falls into a sort of a typical uh, fallacy of historical research, which is often referred to as presentism, uh, that is projecting our present understanding of things on people that wrote hundreds or maybe even thousands of years ago and, and coming up short because, of course, uh, uh, that's entirely unfair, right? That, that those people did not have the, the body of knowledge, scientific, uh, philosophical, or otherwise, uh, that we do have, that we're living in a different place, that we're living in a, in, in a different culture. Um, so, so that's, it is important to do what you, what you said, suggesting. Uh, that said, I mean, in my mind, at least, unless you are specifically interested in the history of ideas and the history of philosophy in particular, uh, my own interest in, in people like, uh, like David Hume, um, is because they actually, I still think, have something relevant to say to the present day, to people li living today. So maybe maybe we'll get there later. But to to go specifically to answer your question, so so Hume was was in the middle of the Enlightenment. Now we we talk, typically think of the Enlightenment as you know, largely a French and and or continental phenomenon, but in fact it spread throughout Europe. Uh, and uh, and Hume was part of the so-called uh, Scottish Enlightenment. In fact, he was arguably the most prominent exponent of it. He did uh, visit France. He was in Paris uh, for a while, and he was, in fact, a, uh, a guest, uh, a, a very highly regarded guest at some of the major salons in, in Paris. So he, he actually had opportunity to talk directly and interact directly with the philosophers uh, in, in France. Um, he was also coming, therefore, after, you know, at the very end, sort of a long uh, tale of uh, religiously motivated uh, and enforced uh, suppression of uh, uh, free thinking and sort of independent ideas. You know, the people were still risking of being burned at the stakes as, as uh, witches in Scotland in, in the, at the time that Hume was writing, which is why some of his stuff actually got published only posthumously. Uh, his, his dialogues uh, concerning natural religion, for instance, uh, which essentially present still today one of the best arguments against intelligent design, uh, you know, he was uh, he was not comfortable publishing those uh, during his lifetime, and and his some his friends advised him not to do so, and, and for, so so that they were actually done uh, came out actually after his, his death in 1776. So that's the kind of uh, uh, now. 
in part, that's kind of the cultural uh, background. Now, what, what was he uh, thinking that he was doing? Well, he was embarking in, in nothing uh, short of a rebuilding of philosophy, the way he, he thought about it. Uh, he, he was influenced, of course, uh, from the, uh, by, by, largely by the new natural history, what we today refer as science, you know, so Galileo, Newton, all those people. Um, and it's the successes of natural history. And he was uh, uh, sort of comparing that to what he saw as the very unsuccessful and sort of sterile set of, 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 of tradition, philosophical traditions that we today call scholasticism. And so he was rejecting essentially medieval philosophy, uh, and he was embracing, he was looking for some kind of new way of doing philosophy. And the new way to, of doing philosophy that he came up with was essentially to embrace the empirical sciences. Uh, you know, a lot of what Hume was, was uh, saying was that, you know, if you, in modern terms, something on the lines of, if you want to do epistemology, you also have to do psychology. Uh, and, you know, if you want to do sort of what we would today would call philosophy of mind, you better pay attention to, you know, the, what, what later became the cognitive sciences and, and so on and so forth. If you want to study causality, you better know something about physics. Uh, if you want to study morality, you better know something about anthropology and sort of what we today would call comparative anthropology and so on and so forth. So this was very much an empirical, of course, Hume is considered one of the empiricists in philosophy together with Locke and Berkeley. But it was a very much empirically oriented philosophy, very much in, in uh, constant dialogue with, uh, with science itself. Um, and this is something, was, of course, that in turn highly disturbed philosophers of a more rationalistic bent and most famously Kant. You know, Kant, a lot of what Kant wrote, especially initially, was in fact a reaction to Hume. Uh, he, yes. he famously said, you know, that, that Hume uh, woke him up from his slumber. Um, yeah. And so even though Kant rejected a lot of what Hume was saying, uh, he credited Hume with essentially making him feel out, uh, think out of the box and, and, and sort of posing some really uh, tough questions that, uh, that philosophy uh, ought to answer. Well, in the same way that Hume, you know, awoke Kant from his dogmatic slumber, I, I feel like this awakening process, this awakening process is not just something that happened in the area of epistemology or metaphysics and then that was it. It's analogous to what was going on in the rest of the world during this time, too. I mean, the level of change that was going on in the average person's life during this time period is just absolutely enormous. It really was like an entirely new species was emerging. But I'm curious to know what you think about this. Um, when David Hume's applying this skeptical eye that we're talking about to the assumptions that people were making in philosophy before him do you think any part of him's trying to prevent you know genius from being squandered like in the way that newton spent much of his life studying alchemy and the bible and you know trying to find the fountain of youth in the same way that descartes built this entire elaborate rationalistic system on top of a foundation that we have an incorporeal soul do you think there's any part of hume that's trying to prevent this from happening again Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that there is any textual evidence for that. I mean, uh, well, in part there is. Hume was definitely critical of Descartes, uh, and and essentially along the lines that that we we've, we've been discussing. So so that interpretation, as far as Descartes is is concerned, is is very tenable. Newton is a different issue because actually both uh, you know uh, um, the kind of philosophy that Hume studied, and 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 in fact even interestingly Kant himself, even though he. he uh, he was a very different kind of philosopher. Um, they were both very impressed by natural philosophy, by science, in particular by the accomplishments of people like Galileo and, and, uh, and, and Newton. So actually Newton and his ilk were a role model. Now, you're right, however, they were referring, of course, to the scientific aspect of Newton's work, not to the you know, biblical uh, interpretations or, or, or to or, you know, exegesis uh, or, to, or to alchemy. Um, which Newton spent an inordinate amount of time doing. In fact, he spent more time doing, uh, I, I understand, biblical exegesis than, than doing physics. Um, now, would have Hume thought that this was a waste of time? Very likely. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I would think so. Um, I don't think that there is any direct textual evidence for that, but, but it's, it's hard to imagine that he wouldn't. All right, fair enough. So as an intellectual pillar in the philosophical world... Uh... You've had many opportunities made available to you that a lot of other people could never say that they had. You know, you've served on panels with, you've had discussions with, you've debated several key players in the new atheist movement in modern times, including, but not limited to, the four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse. Now, pull up 
practically any debate by these gentlemen on YouTube, and you'll find that if, you know, if they're the four horsemen of the atheist apocalypse, David Hume is the horse that they rode into town on, right? Whether they're loosely referencing his thought, whether they're explicitly quoting the guy, David Hume is a part of these discussions that are going on. My question to you is this. What would he think of the new atheist movement? Would he be a fan of these people? Would he be sympathetic to their cause? Would he be one of the horsemen himself? Or would his skepticism be too strong and not allow him to be? Yeah, I don't, I don't think Hume will appreciate the, 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 the new atheism uh, uh, the way it is often characterized. Hume was, uh, if you read his biography, uh, Hume was a very congenial kind of guy. He was... Uh, he, he always trying to be very nice to people and sort of very, uh, you know, he was firm in his intellectual uh, positions. He's, you know, he was not shy to sort of engage in debates throughout Europe uh, with other people about his positions. But he was also very uh, famously very uh, uh, friendly and very open uh, to uh, to sort of uh, discussion. In fact, he, uh, there is an episode, if I remember correctly, in Paris, where um, he was asked whether he was an atheist, and he, and he demurred. He said, "No, I'm not. I, I don't. I don't think a reasonable person should label himself that way." Um, so, so there is both, a, both in terms of character and sort of attitude, and also in terms of uh, philosophical skepticism. I don't think that Hume would be particularly comfortable with the New Atheist movement. What he would be comfortable with is some kind of, you know. Uh, um, sort of positive, what I would call positive skepticism. You know that the skeptic movement, you know, uh, one of the most famous phrases in the skeptic movement is the, the one that uh, originated with Carl Sagan, um, uh, that is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? And it actually technically didn't even originate with Sagan. Sagan made it famous. Uh, it, it, the, the originator of the phrase was uh, one of the other founders of uh, sort of the Skeptical Inquirer magazine. But regardless of that, uh, we have all heard that that phrase, right? Extraordinary evidence require uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now that essentially is David Hume. Uh, Hume uh, didn't put it that way. He put it more interestingly, I think, and actually more broadly, as um, uh, the idea that an educated person ought to proportion his beliefs to the evidence. Yes. Yeah. So not just the extraordinary claims; every claim has to be proportioned to the evidence, right? Of course, if the claim is extraordinary, you, you really do need extraordinary evidence, but if the claim is ordinary, you still need, need evidence in order to believe it. Um, so in that sense, I think David Hume is the, the father, not as much of the atheist movement, as, but as uh, of the skeptic movement. Uh, that said, of course, the boundaries between atheism and skepticism and, and, and all these other, you know, and, and free thinking and, and humanism today is very porous. I mean, a lot of the same people hang around in those, in those circles, although they don't completely overlap. There are some skeptics who are definitely not atheists, and there, I know some atheists who are definitely could, could, who definitely could use a, a, a dose of skepticism uh, about some of their beliefs <laughs> outside of uh, the supernatural. So, um, but I, I, I think that Hume would be... Um, uh, would put himself outside of the fray in terms of, you know, from a, looking at it from a distance, uh, and he would be happy to engage uh, with people in discussions, and would definitely not be uh, shy about defending his positions, but he, but he would not actually be considering himself a new atheist. Uh, I mean, you you put him in that category, but quite frankly, I model myself after Hume. I don't like to think of myself as a new atheist. I, I certainly am an atheist. Um, but uh, but I think I try to model myself toward a more more reasonable and and more congenial model of David Hume than let's say of Sam Harris or, or Richard Dawkins. Still, you read stories about David Hume going to church every Sunday of his life. Like, what's your read on that? Do you think that it was a token of submission? You know, with the witch burnings in the back of his head somewhere. Um, perhaps, or perhaps it was, it was simply just, uh, I mean, we don't know, unfortunately, a lot about this because his own autobiography is very, very short. <laughs> he wrote it, yeah. uh, at the end of his life when, when he was, uh, he knew he was about, you know, he was going to die soon. Uh, and so he put down a few, few notes basically about himself. So it's hard to sell, to, 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 to say, I think that an, an equally reasonable interpretation is simply that, you know, he was a member of a community and, and that's the kind of behavior was expected by the community. And he wasn't one to ruffle feathers unnecessarily. He knew that his philosophy was already raffling a lot of feathers anyway. Uh, he had been, you know, denied twice in academic appointment precisely on the ground that he was considered an atheist. Um, so, uh, so I, I, I think that he didn't look for a fight 
uh, unnecessarily. And so oh. if it's a, you know, if everybody in the community goes to church, sure, I'll go to church. But everybody knows what I believe or not believe, don't believe. Uh, and so they're not going to be fooled for a minute. In fact, there's this interesting story that, that when he was um, sick at the end of his life, uh, he was still receiving friends and even foes in his house. And there were these these, these local clergy who would go on a regular basis hoping to see you know, a, a deaf bad con, uh, conversion of the great atheist or the great agnostic, as he was sometimes referred to. And they never got it. And in fact, they got kind of pissed off by the fact that Hume kept inviting them in and you know welcoming in these hours and you know and being congenial about the whole thing. But he was firm in his beliefs, uh, or I should say disbelief in this case, uh, all the way to the end. You know, he never he never wavered on that. But just think of how much more he could have gotten done if he had that three hours every Sunday morning, if he just spent that <laughs> doing philosophy. I mean, think of how much more he could have accomplished. Anyway, that actually moves nicely into the next question I have because we have the luxury of looking 300 years into the past. We know what subsequent human thought has been 300 years after David Hume. Now, I'm wondering you personally, let's say you could go back in a time machine. Let's say that you could look at David Hume directly in his eyes as he's sitting on his armchair doing philosophy. What is the one piece of advice that you would give him? The one maybe assumption that he's making that would have taken him to the next level? Oh, boy, that's an excellent question. Uh, I don't know that I have a ready answer for it. But, uh, but I think that what I would do is actually advise him to uh, publish his un his, the, the work that eventually did, become, did, did get out only after his death, to publish them now, uh, not to wait uh, because I think that there is a good chance, first of all, that they would have had a, a larger, even larger impact than they already did. But, but most, mostly, more importantly, is that, that he would have been freed from those works. You know, he kept revising this stuff in, like we all do before publication up until the end. And he, he would have been uh, revi uh, you know, uh, freed of those particular uh, uh, works and, and, and uh, perhaps incentivized to do something, to, to, write, to keep writing new things. Now, it is... We, we need to notice that to note that that um, Hume did actually not write any new philosophy for a large chunk of his last part of his of his life. Uh, he devoted himself to other things. In fact, in, mostly he became famous as an historian. He wrote uh, this this stupendous history of England. Um, mm -hmm. So one piece of advice maybe that I would give him uh, would be to just waste less time uh, with <laughs> not with the history because the history was very good. But waste less time with things like, you know, diplomatic efforts and, and you know, chatting with the people and, and, and actually get down to, to uh, resume his philosophy. He, at some point in his life, he was convinced and he didn't have anything else to, you know, anything new to say in, in philosophy. And I think that probably was giving up a little too early. Why do you think his good friend Adam Smith refused to publish his work after his death? What do you think he was scared of happening? I think Adam Smith was a chicken. Um, uh, he was, <laughs> you know, he was, we all due respect, because he was in his own right actually a very good philosopher. Um, but, um, yeah, he, he was just a coward. Yeah, he was just a coward. He was, he was just uh, a, uh, somebody who was very uh, keenly aware of still the dangers uh, um, in publishing the kind of stuff that, that Hume was writing, and therefore also in editing it and becoming an instrument for publication. Uh, and so he just uh, declined, even though his best friend, uh, apparently, or one of his best friends at least, asked him to do so explicitly. Now let me just say, I completely apologize to anybody who's a surviving member of the Adam Smith estate. I, 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 <laughs> look, I think that Adam Smith had a considerable amount of courage to completely overthrow mercantilism when he himself probably thought that it was based on corrupt relationships between chiefs of industry and the leaders of government. Yeah. I mean, that could have just as easily landed him in the stockade or maybe sure. Fair enough. burned at the stake. I guess he only wanted to take so many risks, right? Yeah, true. He, uh, his willpower was exhausted. All right, so... Uh, there's that famous quote, you are the sum total of the five people that you spend the most time with. That's you. Well, what happens with me is whenever I spend a considerable amount of time reading one of these philosophers, I start to become them. Like I start to pick up pieces of their personality. I start to feel like they're a part of me in some weird way. My question to you is this, as someone who has read his more than his fair share of David Hume over the years, has his thinking ever influenced you in your personal life? Has there ever been a life decision that you've had to make where you take a piece of Hume's thinking and you use it in a practical way? Oh, good question. So, uh, first of all, you're right. Uh, when uh, when you spend a lot of time with any author, really, not just philosophers, but uh, but any author, uh, you, you, you start, if not thinking like him or her, you certainly are deeply influenced. And, and you know, it sort of becomes a, 
uh, almost a second nature, at least for the period that, that you're devoting uh, so much effort and time uh, to, to that particular author. Um, and actually, I think that that is one of the great things about philosophy in particular, but also sort of about, you know, reading what used to be called the great books. Uh, that is, you're in this constant conversation with uh, people who are dead. And yes, they're mostly white people who are dead. Um, I don't have a problem uh, with that. And I assume that's because I, uh, I'm, I'm a white man myself. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I, I engage uh, uh, very uh, willingly with anybody who had anything interesting to say, uh, regardless of sort of gender and race. It just happened, of course, that to be the case that most of the canon in philosophy in Western philosophy is, is of a particular type from a particular type of author. But regardless of those those considerations, I mean, that is one of the beautiful things about studying philosophy, that you do get into this constant conversation with a lot of, the, you know, some of the greatest minds that have uh, come out of, of humanity. And this, it's a privilege to me, for me to, to be able to do that as a, as a profession. Therefore, you know, I don't have, I don't need an excuse for it. Uh, if in the morning I get out of bed and have my coffee and crack Plato open or, 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 or the Stoics or, or David Hume, I'm doing my job. And, and it's, it's, it's really a privilege. Now, in terms of specific decisions, uh, that's, that's an interesting question uh, in and of itself. Um, I can't think of a specific decision, but I th- can definitely tell you that uh, especially Hume's dictum of, of, uh, that we mentioned a few minutes ago the, of proportioning your beliefs to the evidence, that, if, that affects every decision that I make. That affects every conversation that I have. So it's, it's really deeply entrenched in me at this point. Um, and... Uh, uh, so it, it, right there, it's a, it's a tribute to, to these men who wrote this stuff 300 years ago. And, and he's, he's with me basically every day, even, even if I don't read him every day. Can you think of any exceptions to that? Like, are there any decisions that we make in life that run contrary to whatever empirical evidence is right in front of us at the time? I try not to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even, you know, of course, the, the obvious example would be, well, really, did you fall in love, for instance, um, because of the evidence? Well, yes, in some sense. That, that, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, I mean, it, I know it sounds weird to, to put it that, that way. And certainly you're not necessarily thinking of it that way while it's happening, right? I mean, because there's a lot of emotion uh, involved. By the way, Hume would appreciate that because he famously said that reason by itself, you know, it it's doesn't, doesn't get you any motivation for action. Uh, in fact, he, he famously and provocatively said that reason is and ought to be the slave of passions, right? So uh, his point was that unless you actually care about something, unless you have emotional involvement in something, it doesn't matter what reason tells you. Reason is instrumental in his mind uh, to achieving your goals, and your goals are set by what you care about. Um, so I think actually you would not be surprised if, by, by hearing hearing me saying something like that. But but yes, even things like falling in love. I mean, you know, you you, you and and staying in love, staying in a relationship is based on on experience. On um, you know the fact that you know you see this person who actually cares for you and does things for you and talks to you and interacts with you on a regular basis. Now, if I were coming home and my uh, my partner were just clubbing me on the, on the head every time that I got past the, the door, I would start having doubts. Wait, she's not supposed to do that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I think this this may be why I'm in a loveless marriage. It's crumbling beneath me right now. This is this, this is good to know. I should have proportioned my belief to the end. Exactly. <laughs> so one more question, and then I'll let you go. You can continue revolutionizing the philosophical world all by yourself. But I want to switch gears here for a second to your blog, the How to Be a Stoic blog. I, I, I feel like anything I say about it is going to be grotesquely inaccurate. I'm wondering, for the sake of me and for the audience... Can you maybe talk a little bit about it and how you got into it and why you care about it so much? So the blog is called How to Be a Stoic, uh, which apparently is going to be the title of, of a book that, I'm, that I will be writing beginning uh, next fall. Uh, I'm, I'm in, uh, in, in contact with a number of uh, publishers about this. And this came out actually of, of something uh, sort of somewhat serendipitous. Uh, so I've been practicing Stoicism as a philosophy, um, as a practical philosophy, which is what it's meant to, it's meant to be anyway, uh, for a, a few months now. I, I, that's because I just got interested, more interested in it. I started reading more. Uh, there, is an, there is a movement for, for, to bring back sort of stoicism as an alternative to, let's say, secular Buddhism or something like that um, for, for the modern mind, for the 21st century. So I got interested in it, and I started reading and all that. And then I wrote an op-ed um, um, piece about it uh, in the New York Times, and that, that piece was called How to Be a Stoic. 
uh, in which I recounted my personal experiences, you know, what the, 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 my, my version of stoic meditations, you know, my, my version of stoic mindfulness and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, I didn't think about it twice. I said, okay, this is going to be a nice little thing to do for the, you know, New York Times is obviously something that's always an outlet that is always a pleasure to publish in. But, um, but I didn't think this was going to be that much of a, of a big deal. And then the following day, the editor of, at the time sends me this email and says, you know, uh, Massimo, the, the, your, your article is actually the most emailed article on the site. And I said, wow, uh, you mean on the Stone site? Because this came out in the, in the New York Times philosophy blog, which is called The Stone. And he said, no, the entire New York Times site. Huh. I said, wow, this many people are interested in, you know, sort of ancient philosophy. And that, that's, that's something astonishing. I mean, it's like, you know, um, so and but even so, even at that point, I said, OK, well, that's interesting. That's that's good to know. It makes me feel bad, you know, better. And, you know, it made my day and all that. But then I sort of let it uh, let, let it stay there. And, and then uh, in, within a few hours, I got emails from a number of publishers asking me to turn that up that that up that piece in a, into a book i said okay <laughs> apparently there's a lot of interest about this stuff <laughs> so so that's what i'm doing uh i've been working with my agent about work on, on on this project and which i will start uh as i said probably in the fall because I, <laughs> actually as it turns out i have another book that i'm finishing in a moment for chicago press um so I, then i thought okay why don't we turn this into a, an ongoing project uh i started the blog and the blog is, is helping me basically sort of crystallizing my own ideas about stoicism, both ancient and modern. And, of course, I, I figure, well, that's, that this could also be a good resource for other people interested. And, and sure enough, it's working out that way. Basically, whenever I read something interesting, I, I put out some excerpts of, uh, of my readings with a commentary on the blog. And then people come in and, and you know, ask questions um, mm -hmm. Uh, I had their own comments, and uh, and it's sort of an ongoing project. So it's yeah, you'll find it at um, howtobeastoic dot org. Was there a significant difference that you noticed between the way you felt, you know, pre stoicism in your life versus post stoicism in your life? Like you can obviously remember a time in your life when you weren't using stoic principles. If something bad happened to you, if that inevitable adversity came your way that the world throws you, the bonds of fate, like what's the difference between the way you'd react? How would you react then? Versus how would you react now? And what specific actionable techniques would you recommend for somebody that's trying to overcome a bout of adversity in their life right now? I can tell you uh, that um, my friends and my partner have seen a significant change um, over the last few months since I started practicing stoicism. For one thing, I get much less irritable than I was before. Um, and that's because I really try to uh, uh, practice the stoic idea that you know, there are some things that are entirely under your control, and that is how you react to things, how you think about things. There are other things that are not in, under your control, uh, and then there are sort of things that are in between. And what you do with the things in between is you try your best uh, to achieve certain results, but then, uh, you know, whatever happens, happens, and, and you, tr you try not to get upset about it. And it really does help. It, you have to do it as a practice. You can't just say that to yourself, what I just said to yourself once, and then it's done. Uh, you do it basically every day. Every uh, every day, I write in my sort of philosophical diary, and I go over, uh, like Seneca suggested, and like Epictetus suggested. I go I go over what I did during the day and how I reacted, and I make a mental note of how to improve it the next time around. And it does improve, uh, you know, little by little, of course. And you know, nobody's perfect, but the Stoics themselves will say will tell you nobody is ever going to reach the level of a sage, which was this sort of ideal. Uh, that, however, never exists in in, uh, in any particular person that the, that the Stoics model themselves after. So there is that. There is also the fact that you know I try. I always try to be somewhat uh, uh, you know the best ethical person that I can. I, I suppose uh, let's let, let's put it that way, and sort of be mindful of of, of my choices, everyday choices. But but since a, a large part of Stoicism, a big part of Stoicism, is to be ethically mindful throughout the day about every decision you make. Uh, you're always supposed to ask yourself, well, what are the ethical consequences of this thing? Um, so I actually, you know, you know, I started doing that more systematically. Uh, and uh, this has, has turned into Im immediate changes. Uh, for instance, I closed uh, my bank account and opened a different one with a local bank because my previous bank was, you know, one of these large corporate outlets that had engaged in a number of uh, clearly unethical practices and uh and so i said well okay i don't want to be associated i don't want to give my money to those people so i i looked for 
the local you know credit union and, and that sort of stuff and uh, and I changed my practice uh, I also uh, redoubled my efforts in sort of eating for instance uh, in, a, in an ethical fashion uh, I was doing that already before but the this idea the stoic idea again of sort of being constantly mindful of what you do and the implications of what you do has actually been very helpful uh, it's now kind of second nature for me whenever I do something whenever I had to make a decision to say, well, what would what would the sage do, <laughs> uh, sort of, and you know, what would Socrates do, or something like that, and then I try to model myself afterwards, of course, imperfectly, and you know, uh, with with the usual failures of every human being, but nonetheless, at least you're trying. Massimo, you are truly a living legend. Uh, <laughs> check out his blog at howtobeastoic.wordpress.com. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure. <laughs>